World Chess Champion Emmanuel Lasker reigned for an astonishing 27 years. However, when he played this game, he was only a year into his world championship, and it seemed entirely pos possible that a promising rival like Harry Nelson Pillsbury could take the title away from him. Faced with this challenge, Lasker played one of the most daring and brilliant games in all of chess history. Pillsbury opens the game with pawn to d4. Although he was an aggressive player living in an aggressive time, he liked to play more positionally before launching his sacrificial attacks. Lasker responds by declining the queen's gambit, and on move four, we are introduced to the Tarash defense. Now, today we kind of understand that a trade on d5 and bishop g5 is a good way for white to play. Black will eventually get an isolated queen pawn after an exchange here, and white should look forward to some kind of opening advantage. However, back in the day that this game was played in 1896, that opening theory was much less established. And so we see here a trade on d4 after bishop g5 immediately. And after queen takes d4, the queen runs to h4. So this is a setup that Pillsbury seems to have prepared for this game, looking to play extremely aggressively against the world champion Lasker. At this point, we get bishop e7 and then castles queenside. One of the things that I love about this game is I think that many young players that I have coached have wondered, why not play like this? Why not develop the queen super early? Maybe bring it over to h4 like this, maybe bring it to a4, and then I'm just going to castle queenside, and I've got my queen and rook into the game as soon as I can, and I just blow the opponent off the board, right? So... This game demonstrates why that's not such an easy thing to do. For one thing, you're often going to lose time moving the queen around as she gets chased by the opponent's minor pieces. We'll see that in this game. And the other thing is when you play for a really early queenside castle like this, especially when you've played pawn to c4, your king is not super safe. So even though it looks optically like a very active position for white, you're accepting some real compromises to your position including an overexposed king and queen, both members of the royal family, and your opponent's pawn structure is kind of resilient. So, Lasker immediately plays queen a5, already taking sight at the exposed white king. We get e3, and now bishop d7, king b1, and pawn h6. This is a great move, and it's one that, honestly, I struggle to kind of understand myself, but over time I've learned that playing h6 in a position like this is awkward for the opponent. As Lasker says, this kind of puts the question to the bishop because you can't really leave it here indefinitely as we're gonna see in a moment. Yes, you can't take it right now because the rook would hang, but the bishop is in an awkward spot. It doesn't wanna retreat, which could open up tactics. It doesn't wanna exchange itself for f6, not e6, because the bishop will be developed for black, you'll lose the bishop pair, and your queen will be hit. So it's introducing an awkward situation for that white bishop on g5. We get a trade on d5, and then after knight d4, black castles here. Now, you might immediately wonder, hey, why not sacrifice on h6, and then I'm just going to win the game because I've exposed the black king. First of all, this would be optimistic even if black captured right away, because you're only attacking with the queen and black can easily respond to that. But even better here is knight to e4 hitting the queen and you'll be able to capture the bishop next turn with basically no counterplay, even negative counterplay for white. It is more likely going to be black that gets an attack on the opponent's king. So this totally refutes the idea of sacking on h6. So we are gonna get a trade on f6. After that, the queen is hit. She moves to h5 taking sight at d5 and then we get a trade on d4 and the bishop comes to e6. Now something John Nunn points out that I think is a really fantastic positional point is that a better idea for Pillsbury than what he played here is bishop c4. The bishop can't be taken because of the, of the pin all the way over here on the fifth rank and that's going to mean that after a move to defend d5 the bishop can pull back to b3. That keeps d5 under pressure, and the bishop is also per performing some defensive functions around the white king. So this is a position that is still advantageous for black. 
We should appreciate that the bishops for black are strong. We like those bishop pairs, but this is better than what Pillsbury got in the game. Instead, not finding this idea or any good way to play, Pillsbury goes ahead and plays f4, which makes sense because you're trying to get some counterplay with f5. The rook goes to c8, pawn f5 hits the bishop, and this is a good moment to pause the video and ask yourself what you would play if you were world champion Emmanuel Lasker. So, if you picked the very good move, bishop d7, just retreating and holding on to the bishop pair advantage, you are a strong player, but you are not Emmanuel Lasker world champion. Emmanuel Lasker plays rook takes c3 here. This is a delightful move that introduces tons of chaos and attacks the white king. I, I'm, I immediately think whenever I see the sacrifice on c3 of Gary Kasparov's quote when he played against Sergei Mosesian and he sacrificed on c3 and won, when he says that even allowing the sacrifice on c3 is an example of a lack of culture, chess culture on his opponent's part, and that you can't allow these kinds of sacrifices. I think this is a little different than the Sicilian sacrifice that Kasparov played and that we often see because this is much more tactical in nature. The white king is exposed, but black does not have indefinite position, positional compensation for the loss of the exchange here. You're going to need tactics to justify the sacrifice. As we'll see, white could even get the advantage if black misplays the position because white's rooks do have potential here and there are open lines for his pieces to utilize. So first off here, pawn takes c3 is just out of the question. It might not be so obvious, but rook c8, also queen takes c3 is really good. Um, and a capture on e6, Queen takes c3, um, threatening to take on d4, threatening queen c2 check, all of this stuff is crushing for black. It's just totally over. For example, pawn takes f7 and queen e2, which is helping defend and keeping an eye on uh, e8 so that you can't just do this, which would basically end things in a lot of lines, does still lose to bishop takes d4. And if you take the bishop, then there's queen c, um, <laughs> not queen uh, a1, but queen c1 and checkmate. Almost anything else would be met by queen a1 and checkmate. I got my lines mixed up in my notes here. So after rook takes c3, Pillsbury instead here goes ahead and takes the bishop on e6. And it looks like Pillsbury is doing pretty well. Isn't the rook still threatened? And if it retreats, isn't white doing okay? I mean, you're going to be able to take on f7, and you got some pretty good light squares to counteract what black's got going on. It doesn't seem so bad for white. In fact, there's another brilliant move for Lasker, and you really kind of need to see this to justify the last move. I'd again encourage you to pause your video and figure out what Lasker played in this position. So one of my favorite moves in this game and of all time is now rook to a3. You take a rook that is hanging and you move it to another square where it is hanging to the exact same pawn. And this is just a fantastic move that is the only way to put pressure on the white position. Now, after rook a3, the best thing to do is to take the rook. Queen b6 check is now very strong and white has to play a brilliant move here. It's another good time to pause your video if you want. Bishop to b5, sacrificing the bishop to connect the rooks and to disrupt the black coordination. Now, after taking the bishop, you have a situation where after king a1, the queen has moved away in the capture of the bishop from attacking d4, and this allows white decent chances to defend. This is a strong position for black. I have a really good feeling that Lasker would have won this position, but it is not objectively completely winning. It's just clearly better for black, but not entirely over at all. Instead, after rook a3, Pillsbury does not capture the rook right away, and he makes a mistake I think a lot of amateur players make. He goes ahead and takes on f7. And the mistake he's making here, I think, is that he's giving a check. There's a saying, Patser sees check, Patser gives check. Pillsbury is not a Patser at all, but I think that's the mistake he's making here is he's not sure what to do. The calculations are super complicated, so he plays a forcing move. He plays a check so that he's 
kind of creating the threat in the position and Lasker has to respond. The problem is that after rook takes f7, the rook is better positioned as we're going to see. Now he has to take on a3 because otherwise you're getting rook takes a2 and that's just no good. <laughs> that's just crushing. Queen b6 check, bishop b5, Pillsbury does in the game play the brilliant move that we saw a moment ago. Still the best move, although it doesn't hold. If you don't play bishop b5, after king a1, you're dropping d4, which is crushing. And if you try to run to the c file, rook to c7 is always crushing. So bishop b5 in this position. Queen takes b5 with check, and the king runs to a1. At this point, Lasker makes a bit of a mistake. The strongest continuation was queen c5 or queen c4, basically the same thing. And after defending d4, uh, we have rook e7 and the simple threat of rook to e4 is crushing. And the trade on f7 where the rook got to recapture is why this is so crushing for black because the rook gets to mobilize more quickly. It gets access to the e file, which it didn't have when that pawn was sitting on e6 before it captured on f7. This basically ends the game on the spot. So, unfortunately, Lasker picks a slower move, rook c7, and he's still putting pressure on Pillsbury, but Pillsbury responds really well. He plays rook d2, which stops rook c2, which was a devastating threat. Rook c4 now comes, putting more pressure on d4, which seems great. And now... At this point, Pillsbury should have played more actively. He should have played rook e1, exclamation point. And after queen a5, which looks awkward because it's hitting both of these, we get check, king g6, queen check, g6. You could pause your videos if you want to find the resource now. Rook e7 check, and after the rook is captured, we get a perpetual check. White cannot win, but neither can black. The queen is going to pick off the bishop with check, and she just keeps checking the king on the 7th and 8th ranks. So, rook c4, rook to d1, Pillsbury plays a more passive move, and we have another win for Lasker. He could have played queen c6, which threatens this, which would just checkmate, and after the king moves, bishop g5 is a really nice move. You hit the rook, and you're on the c1 square, which is a mating square. You're going to win the exchange, and that's going to win the game. Unfortunately, and I kind of suspect that the, although this is move 24, the players were both in time trouble anyway, uh, we'd get rook c3 instead. So this is a mistake. It's too slow, and it gives Pillsbury another chance. He plays queen f5 here. We get queen c4, threatening rook to c1, right, which would checkmate. And at this point, Pillsbury makes the losing mistake. It's a good moment to pause your videos again. There's a lot of good moments to pause your videos and find the right move in this game and figure out what Pillsbury should have played. So what he should have played is king b1. Excellent move, and he actually has the advantage. It doesn't feel so advantageous to me. I can see that Stockfish is saying over here that there's a plus 1.5 advantage for white. It doesn't feel that strong. It still feels like white is struggling to consolidate the king position, but I believe Stockfish and this is a position that white can consolidate, and certainly black doesn't have a breakthrough here, right? Instead, Pillsbury played the move king to b2. It looks like the same idea as king b1. Either move tries to stop rook to c1 and mating, so he has the right idea. He's gonna move the king over and cover a rook check on the c1 square. Why wouldn't you go to b2? It's a better square than it is b1. For one thing, you're defending a3 right? The problem is you're not really defending a3. You have now rook takes a3 for black, another brilliant move, and the third rook sacrifice on either the c3 or the a3 squares. In fact, the second sacrifice on a3, one of the things that's amazing about this game is the geometry and the repetition of different but beautiful ideas on the same square. So, after rook takes a3, the king on b2 is in particular trouble because it's allowing rook takes a2. It's interfering with a second rank defense here. After a check, the black king can escape. You can throw another check on f5, but the king will eventually hide on h8, stopping the checks. Instead, Pillsbury immediately captures the rook. There's not really anything better. You're going to have to capture the rook or allow the rook to capture on a2 or allow black other strong checks at this point. And we now have a forced mate. Queen check, king up, 
b5 check. When the king is forced up like this, pawn checks often become deadly. This is no exception. The king takes queen c4 check. Now the king is forced to a5 here. Actually, I think Pillsbury resigned before allowing this last move, but we're going to put it on the board anyway. We get bishop to d8 check. There is one more move in this position. You can block on b6, but whether the bishop or the pawn captures its mate with the king on a5. This is an absolutely beautiful game with chances for both sides, brilliant moves for both sides, with Lasker offering three different rook sacrifices and achieving a beautiful checkmate, and Pillsbury certainly playing in a vibrant style, getting his own counter chances in defense, and playing the beautiful bishop b5, a great defensive move that if he'd played it a little bit differently and not taken on f7, might have saved the game for him. I hope that you've enjoyed this game as much as I have. If you liked it, check out some of our other brilliant games on the channel. Check out some of our brilliant moves as well. Have a great day, and I hope to see you again in a future video.